Hello and welcome to JSA TV and JSA Podcasts, the newsroom for telecom and data center professionals. I'm Jean-Marc Lima and joining me today in London is Jonathan Evans, Director for Total Data Center Solutions. Jonathan, thanks a lot for talking to me. Um, maybe let's start with you introducing yourself a little bit and talking a little bit about Total Data Center Solutions. Um, but also as well, like, I mean, how, how are you doing anyway with everything that's going on? Let's start with that. <laughs> I'm doing really well, thank you. I've been very, very busy during the lockdown, actually, because I haven't been traveling. It's been a, mm. it's an opportunity to do a lot more work, I found, in the last 12 months. You know, not having to cut flights everywhere and tr tr drive around the country makes a huge difference in terms of what you can do. And I think we can work far more effectively when we compact things into a meeting on Zoom. But, of course, it's much more boring than going out for a few beers after a meeting. Uh, so, yeah, just to tell you a bit about myself, I started when I left college as a boat designer, but I couldn't make a living from boat designing. So I ended up designing computer rooms or data centers as they are now, but computer rooms as they were then. How does the leap go from boat designing to a data center designing? Just going to an employment agency and showing them all my drawings. Oh. <laughs> okay. And they said, oh, you can design computer rooms if you can design uh, boats. So I said, maybe I'll give it a try. <laughs> so it's been a good living for me ever since. You know, it's been a great industry to be in, and I've really enjoyed all of it, really. Um, so then in 2002, I started Total Data Center Solutions, working with a company in Ireland called Global Switch, as it was then, and Citadel 100, as it is now. I then worked to, went to work in the UK uh, for various co-location startups. And in 2010, I went to work for a company in Norway called Green Mountain. Mm -hmm. And they were located on the side of a fjord in, uh, in, in Norway, in a spectacular location. The data center was an old NATO bunker, and they were converting it into a data center. So that was really interesting for me because I got into the sustainability piece and um, I had to market Norway as a data center destination. And at mm. that time, it was a completely different solution, you know, situation to what it is today in terms of people accepting sustainability mm. as, as a big part of it. So I worked with them for a few years. Then I went to work in Luxembourg for a co company there. And all the time I was expanding the portfolio of TDCS to include other sustainable technology solutions. I now work, uh, amongst other things, I work for uh, NodePole in, uh, in, in Sweden and for Eco Data Center, the climate positive data center in Sweden. Mm. So that's where I am now, doing a few different things, um, a range of solutions really, just to try and lower the carbon footprint and uh, operating costs of IT. I mean, you've been a big driver of the conversation um, around sustainability in Europe. Um, like you mentioned, especially Green Mountain and Looks Connect as well. Um, how would you describe the state of the data center market in Europe when it comes to sustainability um, and climate change and climate issues? Well, I'd say we're getting there now. We made huge steps yeah. forward in awareness and action around reducing IT carbon footprints as I started on it 10 years ago, in particular in Europe and the Nordics. The US, I think, still lags behind a little bit. But there are a few exceptions, of course, like Switch Data Center mm -hmm. in the U.S. with its huge solar farm and battery solution. And the hyperscalers in the U.S. are carving a bit of a path in reducing their carbon footprint as well as doing it worldwide. The only issues I have really are regarding greenwashing, which is a horrible fairy phrase. <laughs> but it's, it's um, the renewable energy certificates uh, might fit that description, RECs as they're called. You buy a megawatt of electricity generated mm -hmm. from a renewable source, and then you run your green data center in Germany. But of course, you're not really running on green electrons. Mm -hmm. so that's where it's had a bit of a bad reputation as, as perhaps uh, not quite the green solution we'd expect. Yeah, well, it's interesting that you pick up on that because some of the conversations I remember having um, in the real world when we were allowed out there um, was that a lot of people talking in the backstage of a lot of the conferences, they were talking about how it has cool to become green, uh, it has become cool to, to become green, but at the same time, people are really talking about where the green energy is coming from. So they just want a seal of approval that they are green, but they don't really provide information on how green is your green. Uh, and That's it turns right. out that a lot of the times, the energy that you take from the grid, it's not as green um, as you might portray in your data center. Um, is that still happening a lot today? 
Um, yeah, it, it is, I'm afraid. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, that, funny enough, we're just thinking about the fact that, um, you know, that some of the hyperscalers now are, are really trying hard to, to source green energy, mm. the on-site generation from from uh, big solar farms and, and battery mm. solutions and, and wind turbine solutions. But um, a lot of the big data centers are still being built in, you know, Frankfurt, Amsterdam, London and Dublin, where they all have power issues. And they're not, none of them are 100 percent green. Hmm. In fact, they say that there's a 1,200 megawatts of planned data centers to be built in the next three years hmm. in those cities. So, hmm. you know, we're still a long way from being a green uh, industry in that respect, you know, and, and there's not much we can do about it when you build a data center in Frankfurt or London. They just aren't running on on, on green power. Mm. Yeah, well, that will start involving um, a lot more parties, um, a lot more hands will need to come into the game. Um, but, I mean, you mentioned a thousand megawatts across those four big markets, um, or five if you include Dublin as well. Um, oh, yes, I forgot Dublin. Well, now it has to be the big five. Um, but then, I mean, we also have about another thousands coming between Portugal and Moscow um, um, with several other projects in several countries, especially Spain, Poland, Italy. Um, we just had a few acquisitions in Italy as well. Um, I mean, where, where do you see the, the, the green data center market going, really? Um, and what lessons can mm -hmm. colocation providers take away from the hyperscalers? Because they, they have been pioneers with a lot of things that are happening. The Nordics have been huge pioneers as well, especially with um, heat we use and all this sort of stuff. Um, but what lessons do you think these companies need to, to take now um, to put into action? Because this is not something that you think about in five, ten years' time. You need to think about it now. Absolutely. I, I think um, one of the big things would be investing on on-site generation. Mm. You know, big like, like, like Switch did and like we're offering in the UK, where you have big solar farms on fields next to it or on waste ground next to a data center. Mm. And, then you, um, and, and then you have wind turbines as well and then big battery solutions to store the energy when it's being generated so that you can run the majority of the time on your green energy with a stable battery supply mm. and only have to top it up with a grid occasionally. And that will give you much better frequency control as well because the frequency is a big issue in some of these countries now where they're running on some green energy and some uh, gas fired turbines and that type of thing. So the, the, the grid has become a little bit unstable in that respect. So the more they do with on-site generation, the better. And of course they can try and move some of their data centers to the Nordics. Um, at the end of the day, it's much easier to transmit bytes than it is to transmit yeah. kilowatts, you know? Mm -hmm. And when you transmit kilowatts across across the ocean from Norway to England, you lose the vast majority of the power, you know, in the transmission losses. So it's much better to anything that's not, um, you know, not sensitive to to latency can be put in 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 the countries where the green generation is is occurring. So that's another lesson I hope for you tell the data center operators to take away with them, you know. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's definitely interesting because, I mean, we've had this discussion before um, where not all the data needs to be as close to you um, as some more important data. So for example, your Facebook data might not be as important to having close to you um, as it is to having medical data or autonomous cars data, um, especially yeah. with edge. Absolutely. But so you could have the edge data centers around mm. Sweden and you could have all, all around, sorry, around Germany and, mm. or UK and you can have all the big data mm. being Churned in uh, in Sweden, you know, Eco Data Center uh, took on BMW was a client the other day just for a lot of their number crunching, I guess you'd call it, you know. And obviously, as a consequence, BMW reduced their carbon footprint and they reduced their energy bills. So, mm. so that's got to be the way forward, really. Just have the edge data where it needs to be close to the cities, and then the rest mm. of it can be in big data centers out in remote places like like like, like the Swedish countryside mm. or the or the Norwegian fjords. <laughs> <laughs> but no, but that, that's interesting. I mean you mentioned eco data center um eco data center as well. Um I think that's the one that was built with woods. That's right. Yes. Yeah. That's Can you right. talk us through like all the initiatives that you've also been involved because you've been quite involved with Eco Data Center. Um do you want to talk us through the initiatives that are being done um disruptive initiatives like that one like building a data center out of wood. Um, <laughs> yes. and I mean, how viable is that to to transport 
the technology um, into other countries? Well, you know, all of the technologies I'm involved in, really, um, they, they can be copied in other countries. A wooden data center, it's not just made of any old wood. It's made of, it's made of uh, you know, very high, highly compressed wood to the extent that it, mm. it doesn't burn. It's just the outside of it gets a carbon layer and the inside stru stays structurally safe. Mm. So a wooden data center can be built anywhere, really, like they build airport terminals out of wood now. Mm. Um, and of course, you've got an embedded carbon then in the, the data center from day one because, because the, the wood has an embedded carbon in it. And I was told the other day that um, to build the data center for Eco Data Center only took five minutes of growth from the Swedish forests. Now, how the heck they worked that out, I do not know, but that's what <laughs> they told me. And so that's one of the initiatives. The other thing, of course, when you're building a new green data center is location you have to be able to get rid of the waste heat from the servers. And if you can't do that, you're stuck, really. And that's one of the things that most of the data center operators mm -hmm. fall down on. Uh, data centers in remote locations where they can't use the heat for anything else. That's mm -hmm. that's something which is much more difficult to, 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 to overcome. Obviously, Eco Data Center was put somewhere where they could reuse the heat for mm -hmm. a local um, wooden chip manufacturing plant under the local district heating. Mm -hmm. So yeah, those are the two takeaways from mm -hmm. Eco Data Center. Um, the other things I'm working on are um, the battery storage and the um, and, and the solar farms, and we're doing that with a new type of business model where there is no capex or opex. You know, we provide all of the 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 the, 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 car, the multi megawatt batteries and the solar farms with no capex or opex and sharing the savings in the in the reduced power bill. So, and also there's a carbon footprint reduction. That's a nice simple way of reducing your carbon footprint mm. with no cost to you. You know, mm. the other thing I'm really passionate about at the moment, and I have been for some time, is immersion cooling. I don't know if you've come across that yet, Joe, but I find yeah. immersion cooling really, really interesting. It's quite a big one. It's quite interesting to put essentially servers into water, <laughs> which is not water. But <laughs> Yeah, I mean, essentially, you've got something like a, a chest freezer, which you fill with, with a mm. non-conductive liquid, and then you put mm. the servers into the, into the liquid. And it's so effective at taking away heat compared to water. You know, you don't get many cars which are still running on 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 air cooled engines anymore because it's just not an effective way to cool something. It's about using immersion cooling. We we teamed up with a company called Green Revolution Cooling in the states, actually, mm. and and uh, they've been doing it for ten years now, and it's becoming a bit more accepted over there, but it's still not much accepted here. But but using it, you know, you get what three or four percent of the power demand that you do from. Um, from uh, an air cool solution and, and they're much smaller as well, you know, much less space required. I mean, I really think immersion cooling is going to have a huge impact on data center design in a few years. And I think everybody involved in it, especially the investors, should keep an eye on it because if somebody can build a data center 30% cheaper in two or three years' time than what they're spending today, then it's going to make a big difference to their to their business model, you know. So that's yeah, another thing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and obviously, you know, I, I like um, I like IT renew. You know, they re reuse existing HPC servers, um, and, and they save about twenty five percent of the carbon footprint of building a new a new rack mm -hmm. and a new set of servers. So that's a nice technology as well. You know? mm -hmm. I'm trying to look across all these different things. I've also just come across a company that turns hot water into electricity, and I'm mm -hmm. really interested in that. <laughs> well, I haven't heard of that one. What was that? Know, it's, it's a completely new solution, and I'm really excited about it. And I, I need to, I, it works on ships. I want to find out if it works with uh, immersion cooling. <laughs> Okay, very interesting. That one I haven't heard about before. <laughs> no, no, it's 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 uh, it's, it's fascinating. If, if it if it works, it would be brilliant mm. because then you don't have to worry about reusing the waste heat from the servers mm. when you're in remote locations. You can reuse it, use it to generate electricity and stuff it back into the grid. Yeah. So that that's something which is really interesting for me. Yeah, it makes the whole process much more straightforward. But I mean, one thing that you actually said, and um, this would be, I think, our last question as well. Um, was that you have to have the consideration of building your data center somewhere close enough where you can reuse the heat to to transport it somewhere else to heat houses, schools, hospitals, whatever um, you want to heat with. 
I mean, that's quite interesting because that's a new consideration of building the modern data center. Um, what other considerations do you think um, operators and collocators and even investors have to look at when it comes to building data centers of today and the future? Because I mean, everything we're talking about, saving the climate, saving the energy, um, getting green, going renewable, sustainability, all those things have to be done today. Because five, 10 years time will be too late and they have to be done today. I mean, all the projects are breaking ground now. Um, that's right, that's right. What, what do you think they really need to look at now? Um, what are like the top three considerations they need to have when building the modern data center uh, to make it green and sustainable? Well, I would say on-site generation is number one, if mm. you can, or green sourcing, obviously. Um, that's the, that is the key to it, and that can be done anywhere, really, anywhere mm. in Europe. As long as you, I mean, you can't do it in London, <laughs> but you can do it in, in most places. Mm. Um, the other things would be if you can locate data centers in, in the Nordics, mm. you know, because obviously that's a no-brainer in terms mm. of reducing your carbon footprint. And, and as I said, I'm really passionate about immersion cooling. I think that's mm. going to have a massive impact on, mm. on data center design and power consumption. Mm. So those are my key takeaways, I guess. Mm. Okay, Jonathan, thank you so much. There's so much stuff there that we need a proper follow-up at some point, especially the water versus electricity. I really it's, like all that. On my, it's all on my website. <laughs> I'm doing just about the water and electricity one. I'm definitely going to check that one out. Um, yeah. but, well, Jonathan, thank you so much for talking to me and taking the time uh, to share your insights. And um, thank you to our viewers at home as well for watching JSA TV and JSA podcasts. And don't forget to also check our social media channels for more news from us. Uh, until next time, happy networking. Mm -hmm.